Okay, we are back. I'm very excited to have James Rickards, the best-selling author of The Death of Money and also best-selling author of Currency Wars. You've not only seen him on the New York Times bestseller list, but he's also the editor of Strategic Intelligence. Jim, a real pleasure to have you. Thanks, Doug. Great to be with you. You know, a lot of times people sort of see you as a bit of a doomsayer, and perhaps it is because you do talk in your book about the next financial collapse. In fact, you've said it's going to resemble nothing in history. Well, in the past, we've seen many financial collapses, some of them even recently. Why do you think the next one's going to be so different? Uh, Doug, it's mainly because of the, the scale of the system. And uh, when I say scale, I'm really just talking about size. You can measure it a lot of different ways. Uh, you can look at the concentration of bank assets, the interconnectedness of firms in the financial system, the gross notional value of derivatives, which now exceed 10 times global GDP. You know, in round numbers, global GDP is about $75 trillion. Uh, the notional value of all the derivatives on the big banks is over $750 trillion. All this uh, data is available from the uh, the BIS in Switzerland, by the way. So, um, and, and if you use complexity theory, which I do, and where I'm a little bit – Heterodox is that uh, my analytical methods are different than uh, what central bankers are using, what Wall Street risk managers are using, although uh, there's a good scientific basis for it and I'm getting very good results. But using complexity theory, one of the principles is that the worst thing that can happen in a system is an exponential function of the scale. So if you double or triple the system, which we've done since 2008, you're increasing the risk by a factor of 10 or more. So the next time this melts down, and just look at recent history, the, the, the markets have melted down every seven or eight years, uh, almost like clockwork. Uh, it'll be bigger than the central bank's ability to control, and that's why I think it will be the worst in history. So when you talk about this with central bankers, and in fact, you've certainly been on the speaking tour talking about your book and getting the word out there, what do they respond to you? Well, it's it's interesting. I spoke to, I uh, had a, a personal conversation with Ben Bernanke recently. I've had, you know, dinners and lunches, but, you know, one-on-one -on -one venues, maybe a small group of seven or eight uh, with uh, members of the Board of Governors. Uh, I've spoken to regional Reserve Bank presidents, um, very senior, very plugged-in staff, head of monetary economics at the Fed. So I've actually had the opportunity to, to meet uh, with a lot of uh, top officials and policymakers and actually some foreign countries around the world. And what's interesting is that they don't really debate me when I sort of bring up uh, these uh, different kinds of analysis. I kind of get blank stares like, what are you talking about? Uh, they've <laughs> got their quant quantity theory. Well, seriously, they, they, I mean, they're, they're smart. They're actually a lot smarter than I am. A lot of these people, and I, I've worked with Nobel Prize winners. I was a partner in the fund at Long-Term Capital Management. That was the hedge fund that collapsed and almost destroyed global capital markets in 1998. So I've had a front row seat on some of these uh, uh, near, uh, you know, catastrophic meltdowns that almost closed every market in the world. So I've seen that uh, firsthand. And, and these people have, you know, 160, 170 IQs. They're, you know, twice or three times as smart as I am. I'd say Larry Summers is probably three times smarter than I am. But so they're not dumb. Uh, they've got the PhDs and they've got the quantitative skills. But the problem is they're using Using the wrong models and it doesn't matter how smart you are if you use the wrong model you will get the wrong result every single time just go back and look at the past uh, 20 years or so um, you know the the Fed they missed the the panic in 1994 the Mexican peso crisis they missed the Asian Russian crisis in 97 98 they missed the dot-com bubble in 2000 they missed the mortgage bubble in 2007 and they're gonna miss the next one too because they're using the wrong models so how likely is it, do you feel, that some sort of collapse is going to happen, and should people be panicking at this point? Well, I don't believe in panic, and, and going back to the beginning of uh, uh, our discussion, Doug, you, you said I'm a doom and gloomer. I do have some fairly uh, calamitous um, projections and estimates based on my analytical method. I'm not personally... Uh, you know, a doom and gloom person. I am. Uh, I'm very optimistic. I, you know, I wake up in the morning. I go to work like everyone else. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of out there. But I also don't want to turn a blind eye or turn away from what I'm seeing, what my, you know, models and analytic methods are showing me. And I do see some fairly catastrophic outcomes. Now, as to the probability, I would say it's about a hundred percent. I just based that on 
on history, on the fact that these uh, systems do collapse periodically, uh, that, you know, as I say, risk is an exponential function of scale. So it's about 100%. Now, you can't say the exact timing. Could it be tomorrow? Uh, possible. Could it be September 17th if the Fed raises rates? That could start the avalanche. Uh, but, um, you know, could it be next year? Could it be three years? Those are all possible outcomes. So I don't, uh, and that's not just kind of guessing as to the timing. The, the method itself would say, that you can't know. It's a lot like earthquake science. In fact, uh, the mathematics and the uh, degree distribution are exactly like earthquake science or forest fires, solar flares, or a lot of other phenomena, some natural, some man-made, but no one knows when an earthquake is going to hit a fault line. There's the predictive ability of seismologists is close to zero, but we know where the fault lines are. We know how bad it can be, uh, and we're not helpless. It would be nobody thinks it's a good idea to put a nuclear power plant right on the San Andreas Fault, so let's not do dumb things, even though we don't know exactly when the next earthquake is coming. So as applied to financial markets, I cannot tell you the date when the meltdown will come. I can tell you the fault lines are there. The tectonic plates are pushing against each other. The collapse will come, and what are you waiting for? All right. We're talking with Jim Rickards, who is the best New York Times bestselling author of The Death of Money. He also is, uh, you maybe read a few years ago, his book Currency Wars. He's the editor of Strategic Intelligence. I, I kind of accused him of being a doom and gloomer. And Jim, thank you very much for uh, clarifying that a little bit. You know, right now, these days, we're sort of in, the, in the, the depths of the beginning arguments of the next presidential election in America. Do you think that either party has some solution to the problems that you've been uh, making people aware of? No, and I, that makes my life a lot easier because I don't have to spend much time on politics. I mean, I, I, I care, and I, you know, I vote, and I have my preferences. So I'm not saying that I'm, uh, you know, completely divorced from the political process, but. Um, I do look at the candidates and, uh, uh, you know, I, I've spoken to a number of them. Uh, and uh, if there's one who I think kind of gets what we're talking about, I would say it would be Rick Perry. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with Governor Perry and we've had some good conversations and he's been kind enough to you know, mention my books at, uh, in our meetings at a few of his, um, a few of his uh, speeches and uh, campaign stops and so forth. So I think Governor Perry has some insight here. Um, I've, you know, I've spoken to Rand Paul. As, uh, I've spoken to Hillary Clinton. So I actually have had some contact with the candidates. So th they kind of get the problem. But I do think that in Washington, whether you're Republican or Democrat, you're just captive to a lot of inertia, whether it's lobbyists. Uh, you know, The banks really own Washington. I was in a private meeting with senior treasury officials once. They invited me down to talk about what we're talking about right now, which is uh, risk in capital markets and the right ways to think about it. And they were they were kind to do so. And we spent about two hours behind closed doors with um, with the group responsible for this. And at one point, I kind of interrupted my own presentation. I looked at this one treasury official and I said, you know, I don't envy your task because the banks own this town. Uh, and I expect him to jump out of his seat and be outraged or something. And instead, he just looked at me and said, you're right. Uh, we can't do very much. So um, I think uh, it, it was revealing. Uh, so I think yeah, I sort of knew it was true, but I was surprised to hear him admit it. So um, a lot of the process is captive to uh, the banks. They spread a lot of money around. Uh, there's a lot of inertia, a lot of it by design, because our founding fathers wanted a constitution that didn't allow things to happen quickly. Uh, so I, I guess I'm skeptical that whichever party wins is really going to be able to do very much about the situation. All right. Yet another reason to be optimistic. Jim, tell me, one of the, the fears that people have is they think the world is collapsing. And in your book, you do talk about there are safeguards that people can use. And again, I'm talking about individual investors, not from the government level. And you talk about things like gold. And in particular, you talk about fine art. I was wondering if you could dive in a little bit more and explain why you think fine art is a good hedge against a collapse in the market system. Well, you know, I've had an uh, occasion to uh, spend some time in Europe with, uh, you know, in the United States, uh, when we talk about old money, we're, we're really talking about money that's maybe 100 or 150 years old. So, you know, the Rockefellers or the Vanderbilts or the Whitney's. But when you go to Europe, uh, you run into a few families, and this one family in particular, the Colonna family in uh, Rome, uh, they've had their money for 800 years. <laughs> that family really uh, kind of emerged as uh, wealthy in the political force in the, in the 13th century. So they've been going strong for 800 years. 
And when you talk to families like that and say, well, look, you guys survived, you know, as a family, you survived, uh, you know, the 30 years war and uh, the, the wars of Louis XIV and Napoleon and World War One, World War Two, et cetera. Uh, how do you do it? And they say they look at you and they say a third, a third and a third. And what they mean by that is one third gold, one third land, one third fine art and a little cash on the side for your jet and your yacht and all that. But um <laughs> Obviously, fine art, fine art is a big, uh, big part of the equation. But imagine you're living in a village in Bavaria in 1620, and Wallenberg's burning down everything in his path. Uh, well, you can take your painting off the wall, roll it up, stick it in your backpack, grab your gold coins, get on your horse, and ride away. And after the looting and uh, and burning is done, um, you come back. You should be able to reestablish title in your land, you put your painting back on the wall, dump your gold coins on the table, and you're good to go, and all of your neighbors have been burned out. So it is a tried and true way of preserving wealth through very calamitous times. Um, and uh, the thing I like about fine art in particular is uh, it's not manipulated the way gold is. I mean, gold is is absolutely a, a core asset. I recommend investors have 10% of their investable assets in physical gold, not bank contracts and, and COMEX futures, by the way, but actual uh, physical gold coins. Um, you know, coins or bars or whatever, you know, whatever suits the individual. But uh, for art, you know, a lot of people say, well, gee, I don't have $180 million to go out and buy a Picasso, and uh, mo- very few people do. Uh, but the point is uh, there are some well-managed fine art funds out there. And, you know, central bankers don't wake up in the morning and say, we really have to crush the art market today. I like to say art art trades the way gold would trade, but for, you know, central bank and political manipulation. So, yes, have some gold, but fine art, I think, is uh, – is a good addition to the portfolio uh, land. Obviously, I also recommend cash, and people are surprised to hear me say that. They say, well, wait a second, Jim. You're the guy talking about the death of money. Why would I have cash? Well, the answer is you might not have it forever, but it's good to have right now because, first of all, it's a deflation hedge, and deflation is kind of running around the world. And it also uh, reduces the volatility of the rest of the portfolio. And finally, it gives you great optionality if things tilt one way or the other because I think both deflation and inflation are in play. Uh, once we get a little more visibility, the guy with cash is the guy who can pivot uh, and take advantage of those opportunities. So I think uh, gold, fine art, land, uh, cash all have a role. And then I have some, uh, just my own portfolio, I have some uh, private equity, venture capital type investments and some startup tech firms for a slice. So I think there's a place for that also. I think the idea of diversifying certainly is critical. Of course, the question always is how to do it. Jim, we're just about out of time. But in the last few seconds, just tell us, how can people follow you and follow your work? Uh, thank you, Doug. I'm very active on Twitter. My uh, Twitter handle is at James G. Rickards. Rickards is R-I-C-K-A-R-D-S. So at James G. Rickards is my Twitter feed. And my website is uh, jamesrickardsproject.com. Um, I think uh, listeners will find a lot of information at both places. Thank you. Okay. And we will put a link to those as well as to your New York Times bestselling books at the show notes of today's show at goldsteinongelt.com. Jim Rickards, thanks so much for your time. You are listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future. So join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.